first of all, you need to obviously source your timber um, and recommend hardwoods. Um, I have used uh, pine actually with, with Dan Rees. Um, we made a, a, a pine resin table. I'll talk about that in a, in a bit. But obviously sourcing your timber is, is um, critical. So basically you've sourced your timber, you've got your two slabs. Um, this, this was one slab, cut in, cut in half, flipped round, and then um, it sort of gave us this uh, central piece on the live edge um, of, of the river table. So essentially what we have... Rich, sorry, if I could just to the uninitiated, yeah. um, we, you can use the word live edge or wainy edge. They both mean the same. I'll, I'll, show, you, I'll show you now. So basically the, the live edge is where the bark is on the tree. So that is the sort of living edge, if you like. Um, and that is preserved. That, way, that side's been cut off nice and straight. But the living edge is this, this bit here. Um, so wainy edge, live edge, there's various uh, terms for it. So essentially we had, um, if you can see that there, we had, we had the two bits of wood, we turned them around, we sort of put them together, um, and that part there then is filled with, uh, is filled with resin, as you can see sort of on, on that. Yeah. So if, if you get that, uh, if you get that idea, um, that's what we did. So in, in terms of making a river table, uh, resin is very expensive. Uh, it's, it's about 180 odd quid for, for a gallon of resin. Um, so basically what you're getting is that for your money. So what is really, um, really critical uh, is, is to, you don't want to waste any resin. So in all, in, when it's mixed up, it's, it's very, very runny. It's, it's essentially like, like water. So when you make up a, a tray, um, so for this, this particular one, we use a sheet of MDF, um, like uh, like the, like this. Can you can you all see there? Is that okay? That yes. yeah, absolutely fine there, Rich. If you just keep everything on the table where you are, we okay. can see that brilliantly. So you have to make up. You have to cut a piece of um, your, your base sheet because uh, we're going to make a tray up essentially, and this is this is what it looks like. So you've got your your base sheet, then you have your timber in the corner. And you, and you make a tray that surrounds the whole the, the whole piece of wood, if you like. Um, but you have to make this essentially watertight. Um, so when you're making your your tray, if you've sourced your timber, you've put it together, um, you've measured it, you've cut your tray to suit, you've got your two bits without any resin in it. Um, set into into your tray. Put your sides on it, yeah. And essentially, what you're going to do then is pour the resin down the center. It's really, really critical to when you're when you're making your tray up is to get it absolutely watertight. And the way we do that is you take uh, some silicon. Um, we use silicon because it, it peels off the resin really, really easily. Um, the other thing you have to take into account as well is you have to line your tray with, uh, with I use decorator's tape because it's, it's non-sticky. So you essentially have to go over your whole tray and line it. So when you put your timber onto it, you've cast your resin into it. This surface here, the, the resin won't stick to it because if you don't put, uh, a non-adhesive surface on it, your resin will stick. You'll have really bad trouble sort of getting it out of the out of the mold, if you like. Yeah. So that is that is critical. So making up your mold, you have to line your um, your edges of your of your of your tray of your mold with uh, silicon. So you, can you can you all see that? Yeah, that's that's looking good there, Rich. So you you have to line it all up. Um, I use thicker MDF than this, then you stick your pieces on. 
and you essentially make up a tree. So you line it there, you line it up here. So every part uh, has got silicon on it. When, when that's done as an extra precaution, what you can do, um, you, you fix your, your sides on, you screw them or nail them or however you fix them, is to run a bead of silicon just in the corner there, just as an extra, extra security. Because I have done test molds, um, they haven't been um, watertight. And essentially what happens is you will lose like a lot of money's worth of resin. It'll just seep out onto the, onto the floor and it's wasted. So, um, so you've gone through the hard experience of learning well, I've, I've, I have indeed, and it's, it's really, really critical to, to just to get everything watertight. You've, you've got a picture as getting it watertight. So you, you've made up a tray, um, open top, drop your timber in. When you pour your resin, you do not want any leakage. Um, what I found with, uh, <clears throat> with, with the tray, um, I'm, in my workshop, I'm lucky enough to share it with a friend of mine who's a sign writer. And he does a lot of signs in uh, vinyl. Um, and the vinyl comes in with a on a silicon backed paper. So a quick way, uh, if you go on uh, YouTube and you've, you've seen a lot of videos, um, people who use this uh, non-adhesive non tape, uh, or it's a kind of silicon tape, if you like, and they'll line the whole, the whole thing with that, which is quite a laborious and expensive process to be honest what I did um, I used the silicon backed waste paper from um, you can get it from any site writers they just throw it away which is terribly wasteful but it comes in it comes in large large sheets it's got silicon back on it so it's completely non-sticky and I just used that as as to line the, the main part of the tray it's fine to use tape on these parts um, because it's just a lot easier. But on a flat piece, this silicon paper works an absolute treat. I did it for this table. Um, and then when I came to lift the table out of the mold, it just came away really easily. So would you suggest, Rich, to those watching that they, uh, if they want to have a go at this, that they start with a very small uh, test piece? Um, Absolutely. You've got a couple of pieces, haven't you? So that they can go through the process without large expense and any adjustments and any learning. No, I, I, I think it's, what, it's, a, it's a good point, Dee, but I think anybody who wants to sort of do, uh, do a test piece, um, is, I don't know, just, just make yourself a cutting board for, the, for your kitchen. So resin is fine to use as a, as a food surface. And again, if you go online, you'll see a lot of people who do cutting mm -hmm. boards. But yeah, it's, it's a good point, and I think that's it's essentially a, a tabletop in miniature, um, and you just expand that out when you if you come to make um, something larger. But it's a, it's a good point. It, it, I would recommend that because it just gets you familiar with a the way that sort of resin works in terms of its viscosity. Um, in building the, building the mold is critical, so it would be a, a good cost effective way of sort of overcoming any. Um, Difficulties you 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 may experience on on a more expensive uh, expensive build, but yeah, it, it's it's an absolutely good point. Can you tell us a little bit more about resin, the different types of resin you can buy? I know that there's petrol chemical base, and there's also a cornstarch. There there is there is a cornstarch resin. I think with yeah. which is a <coughs> excuse me an environmentally friendly more environmentally friendly resin. I don't think it's 100% um, um, kind of organic. Um, I, yeah. I think they do mix some petrochemical with it, but it, it's more, um, it's better for the environment in, in, in that respect. Personally, I haven't used it because it's very pricey. Um, and the, the, the resin I use is glass cast 50. Um, so there's, Resin Pro Europe supply resin in, in the UK and Glass Cast, which is the company uh, I use, also um, supply resin. But it, it's not cheap, but it is really effective. I've got to say, with, 
with resin, um, it's it's when you use resin, it's a long cure process. So essentially, what you have is a chemical reaction. You you have a, a, a catalyst. You have your main resin, and then you have a hardener, which is a catalyst, which makes the resin set. Obviously, in any uh, sort of chemical process like that, there is a byproduct of heat. So it does generate heat. Um, the resin companies, in order to get around that, um, have used a long cure process. So basically, the longer it takes to harden, the less heat is generated. Uh, some <clears throat> resin you can get, say for, for a flat roof, it goes off within, I don't know, a couple of hours, but it does get incredibly, incredibly hot. Uh, so steer away from any cheaper resins that have a very fast cure time because they generate a lot of heat. What you want to do with timber um, is use a resin that does generate uh, far less heat and has a long cure time. Um, essentially, essentially with, with this glass cast 50, um, you'll find with, uh, with resin companies, uh, 50, the 50 represents 50 millimeters. So you can actually do your resin to a depth of 50 millimeters. In, uh, a, single, in a single pour? In a single pour. Um, right. If you say, I think they, they do a glass, a glass cast 25, they only recommend you go up to 25 millimeters, but it's a quicker cure time, but it's it's kind of less less resin. So um, the, thicker you, the, the thicker you cast it, the, the longer the cure time the companies put on their resin not to generate heat. The issue with heat and timber is, <coughs> is uh, timber obviously has lots of cells in it and there's lots of air in it. Uh, so when you come to, to cast your timber, um, if you haven't sealed the edges, so for example, on this one here, you know, we, we talked about the live edge. Um, so before doing any casting, what you, you need to mix up a tiny bit of resin and paint it onto this surface uh, because the heat generated in the casting process will bring air bubbles out um, and that will, will, will um, be set in your resin. Um, so really, really important to seal up your edges, not so much on the surface, that's fine, but certainly on, on the edges um, and if you're casting your, your end grain as well, you want re resin on your end grain, see, see your end grain as well. So that is essentially mixing up a little bit of resin, painting it on, letting that dry, and then putting it into your mold and doing your, your main casting. That will um, get rid of it. It'll cut down on the amount of bubbles that actually come out of the wood during the, the, the process. If you look at this one, I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's, there's, in that, there are um, tiny, tiny sort of micro bubbles in there. Yeah, and, and, what yeah. that, and what that does, um, it kind of makes, especially if you're doing a clear cast, it makes it a little bit milky. It doesn't matter so much. If, if you're going to pigment it, it doesn't matter because you, you, you can't see through it. So it, if it's got bubbles in it, it doesn't really, doesn't really affect the look of it. Uh, but only on clear casting. Um, I do it. I do it as a matter of it's just good practice to to seal up everything, whether you yeah. do colour or a, or a sort of clear finish. With the timber, do you want to mention uh, about a bit how dry it is that you don't use green timber? Yeah, I mean, with with all furniture making, I mean, there, there's ways around um, stopping timber warping. But it, it, it is critical to have timber that is um, really well seasoned, probably down to I don't know about eleven percent moisture moisture content, um, yeah. which you can check with a, with a moisture meter. Um, and the the other thing as well, prior to uh, preparatory wise for your timber, what you have to do is to level it off. On um, you have to get one edge absolutely flat. So when you put it in your in your mold, it sits flat on the bottom of the mold. Um, I usually use a router sledge, um, which is basically a router on, on a rail, passed back and forth across the timber. I get one flat side, um, flip that over into the mold. But preparation of the timber is is very 
you do have to get it flat. Um, as Dill said, 11 to 14 percent is is ideal uh, for for um, uh, for for table making. So yeah, that, 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 that's that's a good point. So we've um, we made. Sorry, Rich. I was going to say it's going to be really interesting to hear your um, hear what what ideas you all want to sort of put resin. Uh, you know how you want to use resin, um, and we can with, with the Q and A. I can sort of address and talk about any sort of um, uh, yeah. you know issues that might come up for your particular project, if you, if you like. So we're at the stage of having made a trough and um, we've waterproofed it. We've timbers, we've, we've lined timbers, it. With... Lined it, yeah. The timber's prepped, it's dry, it's mm -hmm. cut to size and the bottom has been flattened. Um, what's the next process here then, Rich? Okay, so what we've done, we've, as Dill said, we've got our trough ready to go. I, I normally, <coughs> you, can, you can either build the trough, um, you, you can get your timber, which is slightly wider than the trough, or bigger than trough, build your trough, then cut the timber to drop in, or you can build your build your trough to, to suit your timber. Uh, very critical to obviously, if you're building a square um, trough, is to get your, your timber to, to the right lengths. So when you drop it in, it's it's all, um, you know, it, it, it all fits in nicely, basically. Yeah. Okay, so we, we, we've got our trough, we've dropped our timber in, We've sealed the edges of the timber um, to stop any uh, bubbles coming out. Um, and ne next thing we're going to do is, is, is to mix up our resin. It's critical with resin that you get, I don't have my scales here, but I, I bought a, a digital scales in Asda, six quid or something like that. Um, so we have our bowl, we sit it on the, uh, on the scales and you need to pour out and it'll give you the, uh, the so on, on this particular one, uh, by weight, it's 100 grams of, or 1,000 or whatever. Say it, it's 100 grams of um, resin to 50 grams of the cure. The right. Cannabis, okay. So it, yeah, it's two, two to one. Two to one, essentially, is what it is. Yeah. But it's really, really important to, to measure it out. Uh, because if you put too much, um, people think, oh, you put more hardener in, it'll it'll make it cure faster. It doesn't. It just really screws about with the resin. And you get soft spots in it. So very, very critical to, to get your resin uh, right. So weigh it out on, on a digital scales. And I usually get it to the to the gram. It doesn't have to be like, you know, to, to, the, to the nanogram, but as so long as it's like, if, if, if I did all that, say, in one, one hit, if it was three or four grams either way, fine, you, you can get yeah. away. So don't worry too much about that. Also, when you're mixing your resin, once you've poured your, um, your resin into your bowl, you've poured your hardener in, you mix it around. If you're mixing a lot, um, I use uh, one of these on a drill, Yeah, um, which really does mix it well. But you don't want to... Um, whip loads of air into it because you get a lot of bubbles into it which although will rise to the surface I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec so if we stick with the mixing then mix it really well once you've mixed it in one bowl it's best to pour it into another one for your final mix because you might get resin um that hasn't been that from your initial pour that sticks to the side of the bowl and again it might mess with the you might get soft spots in your resin which you don't oh, want right, okay so good practice, mix it in one bowl, pour into another one, mix that up, and then you're, you're absolutely um, spot on with your resin mix. So we've taken our resin, we've got it mixed, okay? <clears throat> As it's a long cure time, you know, you, you, you've got a bit of time to, to, to mess about with it. Um, at this stage, you can, you can color it. So for this one, I used, uh, you can either use uh, liquid pigment or a powder pigment. Uh, me and Dan uh, used, uh, Dan's used a powder pigment, uh, the same color as this one, um, which is, um, it's kind of a metallic pigment, which is a, which is a lovely look, um, and it's, it's all sorts of colors. So at this point, you want to add your pigment to your, to your mix. It depends with, 
with your pigment, obviously the more you put in, the more solid color you get. Um, so again, that is something you need to sort of mess about with and just, just get it right. Loads of literature online. So for example, um, um, they'll show you now, they'll, they'll give you actual quantities. I just did it by eye. I thought, yeah, that looks nice. I'll, I'll go with that. Um, the other important thing is, obviously you, once you've got it in your mold, you want to mix up the right amount of resin because you don't want to waste any resin or have any left over. So what we need to do, grab yourself a tape measure. Um, once it's in the mold, uh, measure it in millimeters, cross here, cross there, cross there, cross there, and take your average width of, uh, of the river, okay? Measure the depth and measure the length. And that will give you, um, I use a, conf I can't do it in my head, but it'll, basically, it'll give you the volume of resin you need to mix to, to, to do length that. Length times width times yeah. depth. Obviously, you... with a, obviously with a river table, it's not a uniform width all the way along. So if you take about 10 measurements of it and then get your average me measurement for your, for your width, you're, you're away. Obviously with the length and the depth, it's fine. But yeah, just, just get an average. Um, okay. And that will give so, you your... your, your the, the right amount of mix. So that's good, add, good, add a good point. There. Yeah, so because it's, as I, as I said again, it's expensive stuff. You really don't want to be wasting it by mixing too much or having a leaky uh, a leaky tray. So really, really important stuff. Um, so we've got it to that. We've, we've measured it out. We've covered it. We've sealed our tray. We've flattened our wood. We've put it in. Um, and you literally just, uh, what you can do, um, I put, when this was in the tray, uh, I didn't do it with this one, but you wanna, the resin will shrink a little bit once, once it cures. So if you can look at this one, for example, I put some resin in there. If there's any holes in your timber, you need to, so on this one uh, and on these, you can see at the back there where the where I've sealed it, I've peeled the tape off, but you need to seal it on the back as well. Otherwise it runs out into the bottom of the mold, okay? And um, what, what I found, what I found is, is best to do um, with the, the, if there's holes in the underneath of your um, timber, so I'm gonna put that in that way, okay? I know there's a hole in it, Grab some silicon and just run it round the hole like that. So when you put it down into your tray, it's going to form a seal. So you'll only get a little bit of uh, resin. It won't go past, oh, it won't spread out everywhere. It'll just be contained within the silicon. Similarly, with the top surface, if you run a little bit of resin uh, around there, uh, a little bit of silicon around there. You can just, can you see that? Yeah. You can then, it acts as a little reservoir. You can just overfill it. So when it cures and shrinks back, you're not left with a hole in there that you have to flatten off or fill again. You know, you can just sand that off and you it'll be, it'll be flush with the timber. How do you go from there to where you are now, that final piece? Okay, so we, we, Gone through the process, we've made our tray, we've sealed everything up, we've set our, our uh, timber into it, we've mixed, we've coloured, we've poured our resin, we let that cure over about 48 hours, <clears throat> and then what you're going to come to then is the is the is the finishing of the of the resin. So if you have a belt sander, great. Um, <clears throat> so I've got uh, I've got a couple of belt sanders. So that one there, which is quite a chunky one. Okay, the resin yeah. will take a sanding. Don't start off on a heavy grit. If you start off on, a, on about 100 and 120 grit and it's back and forth with the sander, it'll, any high spots on the resin, it'll take it down. Use dust extraction. Um, I've got a dust extractor for that. Oh, and wear a mask at the same time um, because you don't want to be breathing in 
resin dust really, or wood dust or any dust can do that. Mm. So you poured your resin, you want to flatten it off. And with it. if you don't have a belt sander, don't worry, it's not the, it's not the end of the world. Um, I use, uh, I think Dan's got one of these as well. One of these, which is a little random, it's a, it's a random orbital sander, okay? And again, you've got a dust port on the back there. Um, you need to start off on about a, one, a 120 grit paper, um, which is the, uh, you know, this is a, a hook and loop one, so it's e easy to take on and off. So what, start off on a 120 grit. Don't go too heavy. If you start off on an 80, it's going to leave a lot of sort of marks on it. If you use a random orbital sander rather than an orbital sander, which is that one there, that will leave swirl marks in it, um, sanding, sanding swirl marks in it, whereas the random orbit sander tends not to. So you can pick one up in B&Q uh, for about 50 quid. I think that was a B&Q one. To be honest, yeah. it's, it's been fine. You know, I, I think it's pointless spending out hundreds when that does the same job and it's, it's been absolutely fine. So to finish it then, we've taken out of the mold, we've cleaned it all off, got the silicon off that we need to do. Um, yeah, peel all the silicon off. We start then with about 120 grit and this is critical now. You, you want to get a really nice finish on your on your um, timber so sanding it back and forth start with your 120 get it all nice and flat go down to about i don't know start off on a go to a 180 then again really important to get your um, uh, end grain uh, really nice and, and smooth so all the way around with your with your 180 and take it down to about uh, if you're going to use something like um, um, Osmo oil, some people take it down to about a 320 grit. I would go down to about, I don't know, probably about a 600 for my final coat. But it's really, really important to work down through your, through your sanding grits. So 120 up to about 600, and that'll give you a really, really lovely smooth uh, surface then. Um, you need to look at the resin because that will show up if you if you haven't got rid of all your heavier grit sanding marks that you initially started with it will show up so very very important to get it down to about 600. some people like to go smoother some people take it down to some of the big american uh, river table manufacturers like jeff mack designs they'll they'll take it down to a 320 they think that's plenty i think a little bit finer yeah. is, is, is is better um once you're happy with your sanded finish, um, you can use a uh, Osmo oil is probably the best. Um, but again, it's expensive. Dan's just used some, I know, on a, on a river table. Um, really pleased with the results. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I would use some of that. You could use wax. You could use a number of things, but Osmo oil is good. If you're going to do a chopping, uh, chopping board or a cutting board in your kitchen, again, it's food safe. So something to think about with 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 that as well so um, if i just just take you back a little bit rich and um, sure. if i can get you to elaborate on um some of the colors the dyes um that you can put into the resin so yeah. i have in the past i've put some glitter in it and i've seen so again people can go online and have a look but people put um day glow uh colors in there um you could put um, metal dust into it copper brass aluminium dust so it can look like can metal anything you want in it it'll just just yeah. come in but then again that's that's kind of experimenting with small little projects like like i've done with i don't know just just things like that and so sort of yeah just messing about and yeah and anything you want in it i've seen gold leaf in it um all sorts but I, I think it's it depends what it's used for i mean for, for from my point of view um I, I think it gets to a point with i mean i've so some of the american table makers they use so much resin it detracts from the timber and for yeah. me it's all about the timber and it's about the resin enhancing the timber not the other way around if that makes sense um absolutely yeah. so I, I 
you know, you know, but with dyes, it's um, there's there's oh, the, if you go on my Instagram account and look at something, I follow a lot of the. There's a few Russian uh, table makers there. And there's one in particular, and it, for him, it's all about the timber, and he uses just very subtle colours in the resin. So it might be sort of a, like a, a sort of a grey or or a light blue, but the resin is very subtle in itself, and that really enhances then the timber. I mean, this is kind of my first one, um, so it might be worth looking at just sort of more sort of subtle shades as well, because that. Yeah can work really, really, really well, I think. Have you used any natural dyes? Do you know if you can use uh, any natural dyes or pigments with the resin? Um, um, it would have to be, they couldn't be water-based. They would have to, um, in order to mix with the resin, um, and it's, it's a really good point actually, because if you could use natural dyes instead of, uh, instead of some of the more industrial uh, dyes they use. Exactly. Because, uh, it, it's something that Kath and I have talked about, and we'll probably need to need to explore and, and look at that because I think using natural dyes would just be lovely to be able to to say that you know we've used natural dyes with this. Timber. Copper oxide. Copper oxide. Cat's I've not. Mm. I'm yes. One. I think there's a project here for us to I, I they're, 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 have they're a little look at an experiment. Absolutely, and I, I think I think going forward, we will definitely definitely have a look at that. But um, j j just to go back to to the to the uh, use of resin, if you do if you do look on my Instagram account, have a look at some of the people. Um, what I is your follow. Instagram, uh, Rich? Sorry, it's Timber Rich underscore Woodworkers. Um, right, and there's I, I follow a few people, but look at the look at the Russian uh, table makers. I think there's one, Darushni Burkov or something. He's brilliant. He, the way he uses resin and timber is amazing. And I, I think he's, he's got it absolutely spot on in terms of that, that mix, you know, so it, it's, it's really, really good. So we're, worth looking at. Um, um, just, just to go back on what you were saying about timber and the Americans using sometimes too much resin. And what this really is about is the enhancement of timber and especially timber that we would otherwise chuck away or burn or whatever. So I've just got with me there, if you can see it, um, which is just a, a slab of uh, crosscut of a piece of oak. What naturally happens there is you get that split that occurs. Now, um, I think, yeah, you, you tend to sort of chuck that away you can imagine something like that with resin in it, uh, sanded back. As Suddenly it, it looks very expensive and um, yeah. it looks like it's meant to be something. And it turns otherwise waste product or very low value. So per tonne firewood is roughly about 70, 70 pounds a tonne. Um, and it's a very small proportion of your uh, the, the value of a final product. It's about five percent is the actual timber. Could be less than that if you're using uh, lower value timber. So you're converting something that has next to nothing in its value and adding a massive amount of value to that. So that table that you're leaning on there, Rich, is a is a fantastic example of that. Yes, yeah, which, which is yeah, absolutely. And and also, can I can I just say as well with it's interesting you brought up that split in the timber um, because uh, you know you can use resin to stabilize uh, splits in timber as well. So you've got um, almost a solid sort of tabletop, but if you've got a couple of splits in it, then yeah, just just using resin in a very subtle way just to stabilize and fill those those splits, which works really well as well, so. Yeah, and you did, um, interestingly, you've made a um, table, um, a very large- um, I'll talk about that. Was it not a dining table, it's for a board room table, I think well, it was. I, I worked on this as a project with, um, when I was with Groundwork, and Dan knows all about this table because we, we essentially built it together. Um, and what I, we were asked to make a three meter by a meter wide 
a conference table for a property development company. So what we did, we made a Shosugi Ban um, conference table. Shosugi Ban is Japanese for burnt cedar board. Um, it, the, the Japanese used to burn their, a uh, lot of houses out of wood, they used to burn the outside of the board and carbonize it, which is essentially a wood preservative. So it would stop insects burn into it and uh, plants growing on it, um, you know, because they didn't want to chew into the carbon. Uh, so what we did, we, we did this Shosugi Ban. We made up a tabletop out of pine. We burnt all the top of it with a massive, with a, with a road maker's blowtorch thing. And um, we, we cast the whole thing in resin. So it was actually, the top was encased in resin. It wasn't like this one where we've uh, sanded the wood back. So you have exposed wood, resin, exposed wood. It was all resin across the, the top of it. And it was a fantastic effect. It was absolutely lovely. It's on the, it's on my Instagram post. So yeah. yeah. So um, thank you everybody for joining us today. It's yeah, been absolutely brilliant.